you all for coming in. With the second oldest population in the nation, 45% of Vermonters are either retired or about to retire. As we know, many of them do so elsewhere. I'm sure each of us in this room have heard from people who tell us they just simply cannot afford to retire here in Vermont. Many of them leave the state, and those who stay are burdened with the increasing cost of living while on fixed incomes. They deserve, as much as anyone else, to live with the dignity of a retirement they earn through a lifetime of work. Part of what has made us so uncompetitive with other states is Vermont was only one of a handful of states to fully tax the federal tax proportion of Social Security benefits. In my budget address in January, I asked the legislature to join me in changing that, and I'm very pleased to be here today to report that together we did just that. Working with the legislature, AARP, and many others, we were able to eliminate the income tax on Social Security benefits for low and moderate income Vermonters. Commissioner Sansom uh, will, be, uh, will go into more detail shortly, but this new exemption saves about 37,000 low and moderate income Vermonters, about $5 million this year, and that will continue to grow. For folks on a fixed income, these savings each year will make a difference. But we have more work to do to seek tax relief and make Vermont more affordable for retirees and all Vermonters. I want to thank Administration Secretary Suzanne Young, Finance Commissioner Adam Gresham, and Commissioner Sampson and their entire team for their hard work. I also want to thank the legislature, the House Ways and Means and Senate Finance Committees for their work to strengthen my original proposal so we could implement a full exemption for some this year. And I'm pleased uh, to have here today uh, Senator McDonald and Senator Soucy, as well as Representatives Ansel, Baser, McFawn, Sullivan, Turner, Wright, Myers, and Shaw here today. Did I miss anyone? Great. And to AARP, we're pleased to have great Greg Marshall on, Marshall Dunn and his colleagues here as well. I thank you for your support and for ensuring we understand the impact of this tax on your members. While we have much more work to do, this relief, coupled with the Working Family Taxpayer Protection Act, provided $30 million in income tax relief. Additionally, we uh, ensure two consecutive years without raising a single tax or fee in the general fund and level property tax rates for residential payers. With that, we were able to take critical steps to helping Vermonters keep more of what they earn and move up the economic ladder. As we continue to work to make Vermont more affordable, grow the economy, and protect the most vulnerable, these steps help us move closer to each one of those goals. I'll now invite AARP State Director, Greg Marshallden, to say a few words on behalf of AARP. Thank you, Greg. Thanks, Governor. Probably won't surprise you that no issue, federal or state, is more important to AARP than protecting the financial security of older Americans. And Social Security is a critical component in that financial safety net. Social Security provides a basic foundation of income security for over 143,000 Vermont retirees and their families. Seven out of ten Vermont uh, Social Security beneficiaries rely on that money as a primary source of their income. Over the past year, we've heard from many older Vermonters who are struggling to make ends meet, and the income they get from Social Security is absolutely critical lifeline for them. While much of this work in this area has been done at the federal level, the practice of state taxing Vermonters and their benefits clearly needed to be addressed. When we launched an effort and a campaign here in the State House with our members across the state to ask them to contact the governor and their state legislators to let them know how strongly they felt about this issue. And while the session did last a little longer than I think most people thought it might, we did get it done, and we're really happy to be here today to celebrate this accomplishment on behalf of the 37,000 or so low and moderate income Vermonters and retirees who are going to benefit from this new law. Vermont was really only one of a few states that still tax Social Security benefits at the income threshold set by the federal government way back in 1984, when the median income of Vermonters was significantly lower. So as a result, the number of Vermonters paying taxes on their Social Security benefits had more than doubled over the past 34 years. 
The measure fixes this outdated structure and boosts the household budgets for thousands of older Vermonters. Finally, I'd just like to thank Governor Scott and all the legislators that are involved in this. We met with Representative Wright and Representative Ansel many, many months ago uh, and started talking about this issue at a time uh, where I think a lot of people look around and see not a lot getting done in Washington, not a lot of bipartisan cooperation on important issues. It's a very exciting to AARP and to AARP members to see that happening here in Vermont. And we were thrilled to see Democrats and Republicans work together with the governor to get this done. We're really proud to be here today. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Kai Sampson, Commissioner of Taxes, and I just want to get into some of the details of how this exemption works and who it affects. Um, and before that, I just do want to uh, thank uh, members of my team that are here today, Andrew Stein, Doug Farnham, uh, Lynette Kemp is here from our office, and Deborah Carroll, and all of them had a hand in uh, designing this exemption and, and helping, helping uh, work with legislators and the administration to, to get this uh, to fruition. Um, before we get too much into the exemption, it's important in, in Vermont and what was passed and the little impact is important to understand uh, what um, Greg alluded to a little bit, uh, which is how taxability of Social Security benefits works at the federal level um, and how prior to this year it worked uh, in Vermont and only three other states that, that failed to provide any additional exemption. But uh, at the federal level, um, uh, Social Security benefits depending on your income are taxed, um, up to 85% of them are taxed, down to zero, depending on your income. Uh, but the thresholds to have it completely not taxed at the federal level are quite low, uh, around $30,000 of combined income for uh, married filing jointly. Uh, Vermont's always, again with those other three states, has always been linked in such a way that if it's taxable at the federal level, but or whatever portion of your Social Security benefits are taxable at the federal level flows through and became taxable in Vermont. That now changes because we've um, expanded that exemption uh, quite a bit. Um, so now the, the way it'll work is that that taxable portion comes through and goes through a Vermont-based calculation to see if all or some of it uh, is additionally exempt from tax in Vermont. Um, so it, what I hear a lot about um, as a CPA and, and being staying close to the tax preparer community are a lot of anecdotes and stories about the tax competitiveness and the advice that sometimes as uh, faithful Vermonters, these preparers, uh, it pains them to give advice to, to think about you know, moving or going to that second home and making that a permanent residence out of state uh, or even moving to a different state where the children are perhaps um, be closer to the kids and grandkids and to have one more um, factor in that decision be the fact that uh, there are great tax advantages of doing that. Um, it is, is not, has not been good for Vermont as far as tax competitiveness. So along with other things that were in the um, Working Family Protection Act, um, this does assist in our, in our tax competitiveness. Um, as we've heard, about 145,000 uh, Vermonters receive Social Security benefits. Uh, 80,000 of those receive or pay some type of um, tax at the federal and state level uh, on those uh, Social Security benefits, so about 65,000 are already fully exempt due to the federal calculation. Uh, of the 80,000 that, um, that are paying some uh, tax at the federal and state level in Vermont, this will affect, uh, you heard 37,000, you know, almost 40,000 Vermonters, about <coughs> half of Vermonters that are paying Vermont income tax uh, will pay uh, zero or um, a portion or will have uh, the tax of taxable portion of that be zero to uh, some, some percentage, so they, they will get some benefit from this. Average benefit uh, across that whole population of about 40000 is $125. Um, the benefit among those that are under the thresholds, which I'll go into in a minute, uh, can be upwards of $400. And uh, we ran a couple scenarios um, where folks' Vermont taxable income could go uh, almost in half from like $1,200 of, not taxable income, sorry, that Vermont tax could go almost in half from about $1,200 to closer to $600 because uh, taking full advantage of this additional exemption. So um, very generally, uh, married filing joint filers with um, adjusted gross income, $60,000 or below, will no longer pay uh, or have any taxable Social Security income in the Vermont calculation. Uh, that benefit phases out for married filing joint between 60 and 70,000 uh, proportionally. So if you're halfway in that phase out, 
uh, I think at 65,000, um, 50% of your federally taxed Social Security will be exempt in Vermont. So the benefit stretches all the way up to 70,000 for married filing jointly. And then for single filers, uh, everyone under $45,000 of adjusted gross income in Vermont will have no uh, taxable Social Security included uh, in the Vermont calculation. And then there's the phase out between 45 and 55. So um, anyone single with $55,000 of adjusted gross income or less, and anyone married filing jointly with $70,000 income or less uh, is likely going to get some uh, benefit from this proposal. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to emphasize again that this is not just retirement income, this also affects uh, all recipients of Social Security, which includes disability and survivor benefits. So, uh, and, and it, as you can hear from those um, thresholds I just mentioned and the populations that this really does um, help with tax competitiveness, but also uh, it's an aggressive proposal that really helps uh, Vermont's uh, vulnerable populations and helps folks that are struggling on fixed income to keep more money in their pocket. Uh, so that, that concludes uh, my comments, and I think uh, we'll open up for questions. Sure. Um, maybe if we have questions about this subject first. So what do, you, uh, what do you expect the immediate impact is going to be on the seniors? Um, are they going to be able to either save more, spend more? What, what's the biggest benefit? Yeah, them? well, whatever they uh, choose to do with their money, there'll be more money in their pocket uh, every single uh, every single month uh, than before. And uh, I think that that is something that's long overdue, uh, particularly with a vulnerable population. And again, just gives them more money to do whatever they need to do uh, to take care of themselves and their households. Uh, why, why did it take so long to see this election? Um, well, it's a good question. I, I, I've heard, uh, you know, over uh, the last few years uh, about this inequality uh, among states. Uh, I chose to, to move forward on it because I, I thought we need to be more competitive. Uh, we are seeing a number of, of people, I believe, leaving the state uh, for tax reasons, and uh, this was one of, we didn't need to give them another reason to do so. So uh, just a fairness issue and to, uh, to make us more competitive with our, with our other states in, uh, and across the nation. Was this one of the easier uh, asks? and easier paths to sort of bipartisanship that you saw this year? Well, it, it is good news. And when we have uh, bipartisan support, uh, I believe that uh, in the end, uh, because we had surplus money, we had more money coming in, uh, that uh, this made it easier, and uh, this was the year to do it. So I am uh, very appreciative of the, the support from a bipartisan standpoint uh, to, uh, to accomplish this. And I believe that, uh, again, this will be beneficial for uh, vulnerable Vermonters as well as those who just uh, seek to retire here, and uh, we need to keep them here. You, uh, if I heard you correctly, you said the work through the session made it better, made the proposal better. What what improved? Well, we were going to phase it in over a three-year period. Um, the work of the legislature uh, made it uh, made it. Uh, uh, they were able to do the accelerate that and do it in one year. So that was uh, that was the improvement. I believe that was the improvement that was made. Ty, was there anything else? Uh, that, that's it. It's the same same administration proposal. Just uh, it's effective. It's important to know it's effective now. It's effective in 2018. So to the question of what does it mean for Vermonters, Social Security does not withhold state taxes for the states. Um, so many folks that are they're in these income ranges and are primarily their income is Social Security, uh, if they have a tax liability, are having to pay estimated taxes. So one thing I, I'm glad you asked the question I forgot to mention is that folks that are working with a tax preparer or do their own estimates, they can wait and potentially get a bigger uh, refund next spring, but they can also look at the estimates that they've been paying, the quarterly estimates, and perhaps in some cases skip the last quarterly estimate. Uh, or uh, reduce their quarterly estimates to see more money in their in their pockets immediately. This this uh, change is effective, you know, or is effective for tax year 2018, meaning all Social Security income reported as of January 118 uh, through the year. And Greg, is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of what the benefit is for the retirees? What would they do with the money, um, the extra money? I, mean, I think you know much of what you said, Governor. I think you know what we're seeing is. Um, you know, this money's going to go back into local economies. 
And so if it's an extra two, three, four, five, eight hundred dollars a year, to some people that may not sound like a lot, but to folks living on a fixed income, that's a significant amount of money. And that money is not, you know, it's not going to go anywhere else, but into, you know, somebody's going to be able to go out to dinner at a local restaurant. They'll spend money in their local communities more. This money is going to stay in Vermont and be spent here. And as the governor said, people are going to be able to do uh, what they want with their own money. Um, and we agree with the governor, too. This was a pure issue of fairness. We didn't think this was fair at all. Um, and I think that was recognized by both the legislature and the governor, and I think it's one of the reasons why we were able to get to this um, pretty quickly. If I recall correctly, you didn't actually sign the bill that this measure is contained. Is there, Correct. Is, is there any irony in you taking credit for it now? Well, I, listen, I, I don't think I took all the credit for it. I'm giving a lot of credit to the legislature. Um, couldn't do it alone, as you know. Uh, there's a bipartisan support, which is important. Uh, but uh, as you know, as I think most uh, legislators would acknowledge, uh, I thought the, the budget was, uh, was good in a lot of ways. Uh, I disagreed uh, with raising a tax in a year when we had a surplus. And that was the basic premise for my vetoing the bill on a couple of different occasions. Uh, but in the end, uh, I believe that the, the, the meat of the, the budget itself uh, had a lot of the proposals that I had initiated uh, that we worked together on. So throughout all the drama, even though we had a lot of drama throughout the legislative session towards the end, um, again, I, I think that uh, there's a lot of good uh, that came out of it, and we, uh, we need to acknowledge that. You, you proposed this Social Security adjustment. Um, has this been, and maybe this question for Representative Ansel, uh, has this been discussed in past sessions? Has this been? Sure. Um, yeah, we started looking at it last year, actually, and um, we just, I, I think what really happened is the federal tax changes gave us an opportunity to restructure our income tax code. And so we were thrilled when the administration came in with this proposal and included the Social Security exemption um, as well. So we've been looking at it for a couple of years, and suddenly we have the opportunity to do it. that didn't sign the letter recommending the president's nominee for the Supreme Court. Were you asked to sign it and declined, or were you not even asked? This is the part where <laughs> 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 you want to answer the question. Because you're welcome to this discourse that I just stay here for the of a nonpartisan organization. <laughs> As I recall, uh, we, I believe we were asked, uh, I was asked uh, to sign on the letter, uh, but uh, uh, from my standpoint, uh, as I said last night, I, I don't want to rubber stamp anyone. I don't know much about the, the nominee. I believe if there had been a letter asking for a fair uh, and open hearing on uh, the confirmation, I would have signed it. Uh, but to, uh, to blindly uh, rubber stamp someone that I don't know a lot about, uh, I th didn't think it would do uh, great justice to anyone. So I, I decided not to sign on to the letter until uh, I learned more. Senator Leahy is seeking, I guess, about a million documents from the nominee's time working in the White House. Is that something that you think should be reviewed? Well, I, again, I believe that th this nominee should be treated just like any other nominee, uh, fully vetted. Uh, I believe that there, there should be uh, those hearings and ask all those important questions. I mean, this is Supreme Court's uh, uh, significant uh, in, in many different ways. So I think we need to learn as much about the candidates as possible. And who asked you about the letter? Was it the White House or was it the uh, you know, again, NGA or I, I can I can find that out, but I don't, I don't know at this point in time. I just don't recall. The, uh, the vice chair of the Republican Party, the state Republican Party, uh, put out a tweet basically criticizing you for not signing the letter. Um, I won't ask you to comment on the tweet, but I will ask, you know, is there a troubling, is there a distance between you and the party 
uh, and is that concern keep going to the elections? Well, obviously, you know, I don't want to disagree with with uh, the party, but I have to do what I think is right for Vermont and for myself. Uh, and again, without knowing the nominee, without doing my uh, uh, my homework and looking at uh, the credentials and so forth. I just don't feel as though I can blindly rubber stamp uh, a nominee of any sort. Uh, and I, I don't believe, uh, I, I'm not sure that anyone should do that, but uh, but they chose to move forward with the letter. And just to be clear, you're not saying you oppose the nominee, you're saying I you haven't don't know. said that because, yeah, I don't, I don't know much about the nominee. I haven't uh, done uh, much in, in terms of uh, my homework and, and trying to to research that, but uh, I'm sure it will all come out in, uh, in the Senate confirmation hearings. Uh, there are some reports out that you're changing your social media policy after taking some criticism for blocking users. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, why that's happening? Yeah, and, and I may uh, have Rebecca come up and, and uh, elaborate on that, but you know, we thought our policy uh, was uh, in, in terms of trying to keep uh, as open as possible. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't tolerate uh, incivility uh, and disrespectfulness. And I believe uh, that we have also uh, an obligation to make sure that we keep it clean in some respects. When there's racial bias and, and there's inflammatory remarks made about uh, different categories of people, uh, I believe that we want to be welcoming and opening to all. Uh, but uh, when there's that much discourse and really hateful discourse, uh, we felt there was an obligation uh, to demute that in some way. So we uh, we took uh, what the ACLU uh, has suggested. We're trying to change the policy. We unblocked all of those that we blocked. Um, we're starting over from scratch with uh, with a policy that we feel uh, is uh, is more in line with the ACLU would like. But. Again, as you know, some of your, your social media and some of uh, your responses, uh, sometimes uh, you can't tolerate that. And we chose not to tolerate some of them. The ACLU is saying that some of the people that were blocked, you know, according to their review, it wasn't just people that were making hateful remarks. It was some of it was just, you know, they were opposed to your political stances. Um, I'll have Rebecca answer some of that because I didn't see them all. Um. So I'm not sure. I think I don't think it's review. I think anecdotal. They yeah. received some yeah. anecdotal. Our policy has been um, it, it's been outlined on our page, and just to be really clear, uh, comments have only been deleted when they violate the policy, and the policy is based strictly on vulgarity, language, hate speech, things of that nature, um, not local viewpoint whatsoever, uh, and they've only been blocked when they've repeatedly violated that policy. What we took back from the ACLU uh, was that our policy could be more specific in the language, and that's what we're working to fine tune right now. And given that we are going to be more specific, we thought we'll start from scratch again. But we, it has been exclusively focused, and I would challenge any of you to go to um, any posts, even prior to the ACLU letter, and find a single post without um, counter uh, opinions towards the governor on it. Uh, so it was not based on that whatsoever. It was exclusive to um, comments towards and really focusing in on attacks to other uh, folks. An example of a deleted comment would be um, telling a female commenter, a male commenter telling a female com commenter to suck an expletive, um, telling a female commenter she was a whiny expletive. Um, saying things like, why don't you expletive yourself before I make it easier for you to get expletive, you expletive piece of expletive. These are the comments that we're deleting, and again, as the governor said, uh, his page is a page for all Vermonters of all ages, and everyone should feel uh, able to com and comfortable coming to the page, expressing constructive criticism, expressing unconstructive criticism in a way that isn't um, going to be um, harmful to our kids, setting a bad example for our kids, or offending entire groups of people with racial, homophobic, um, slurs against transgender individuals. This is what we've been focused on. So we'll fine tune the language uh, to improve and make it more clear as to what's being, um, what we're moderating, uh, and we'll start from scratch uh, from there. So uh, Rebecca, how close are you to finalizing that policy? Because it seems like people have been unblocked now, and so we won't 
be moving forward, nobody will be uh, re-blocked until we put forward the new policy. So, so we're still you, finalizing you, what that would constitute, uh, what the, and I think we talked about, part of it was procedural, how we were communicating with and documenting that was part of the ACLU's concern. So as we, we're still finalizing those procedures, so until we have those procedures finalized, we're going to leave everybody uh, as they are. We do use, and this is something offered by Facebook, where you can put in a profanity filter, and that automatically hides comments. That's still in place. That's something. That's a feature offered by Facebook. It's clearly uh, content neutral because it's just based on the language used. So are you, is it going to be like the Wild West until you finish this? Uh, Minus the profanity <laughs> filter. Um, so we do have a profanity filter so that those uh, really vulgar terms will be uh, hidden until then. But we're close. We're close. We just we want to communicate with the ACLU before we finalize and put the. You're still forward. free to comment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was that filter on before? Yes. Okay. So that so was a big. That was a big. That was a majority of I would say what was getting uh, hit at was through the filter. Oh, so it was auto automated. A lot of it. Not. I wouldn't say all of it, but the attacks on people that may not have used a profane word, but were personal right. attacks on individual commenters um, would have been an example of something that might have been deleted that wouldn't have been picked up by the filter. Yeah. Can set up an uncensored channel. <laughs> uh, Governor, does it, does it make you uncomfortable knowing that some of these things have to be censored as you're trying to balance First Amendment rights and protections? Uh, absolutely. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I've conducted my life, uh, my political life, my business life, uh, in trying to treat people with respect and civility. And I, I believe we have an obligation to do so, be as open as possible, uh, but set conditions in, in order to do that. And, and I, don't, I, I think we have to be better role models. I think we, uh, we have to set examples, and we, uh, we certainly uh, want to do so uh, with uh, our kids and those who, who uh, are supposed to be looking up to us. So we have an obligation uh, to, to be better people. Governor, kind of patient was avoiding a lawsuit like that page in Maine or uh, in Maryland and Kentucky uh, that the ACLU is suing about Facebook? Well, again, uh, you know, we want to avoid any lawsuit uh, if we can, uh, and we want to be uh, honor the First Amendment, and I believe in the First Amendment, so uh, we're, we're willing to work with them uh, to do whatever we can uh, to be as open as possible, but again, to, to have uh, certain conditions uh, where we, uh, we expect uh, people to act appropriately. Governor, kind of out of the blue question as we're in the middle of summer, but I, towards I, the end I'm of, not used to that. <laughs> towards the end of the school year, we saw school safety assessments, uh, grant applications are being reviewed now. Um, is that a conversation you see carrying over into the new school year and maybe even the legislative session? Yeah, I don't believe this is over. I mean, these were uh, fairly small grants. We believe that they will make a difference, uh, but, uh, but uh, as we move forward, uh, our task force will uh, will make recommendations as well as to what we can do to protect uh, our kids, to protect those in a community, uh, community atmosphere, uh, trying to address uh, mental health issues and the underlying anger uh, that exists and the violence that exists in our society. So uh, I, don't, uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, there was uh, more requests for dollars to, to make sure that people are safer. Are there any particular disparities that the assessments found that you hope to see addressed? Yeah, I haven't looked through uh, the assessments and to see exactly uh, what the, uh, the awards are going to be, and I, I will do so. Uh, but, uh, but I don't believe that there were any surprises from my standpoint. Governor, really you brought up, uh, I believe, the uh, uh, surplus. Do you expect to see any kind of surplus next year, uh, these that continue, and uh, why or why around? Well, stay tuned. Uh, we have an emergency board meeting tomorrow, and we'll be uh, we'll be unveiling uh, that uh, that request. We have the economists uh, that have been focusing on that, and we'll have uh, some news tomorrow. But um, suffice it to say, I, I think it's uh, positive news where uh, we're seeing surpluses. Uh, we saw uh, an unprecedented surplus uh, for the first time in quite a while uh, in terms of our, our state revenues. Uh, and uh, we hope to see that uh, continue. If we focus on the economy and, and, and grow this economy and make the right investments, we'll continue to see growth. Have you reviewed the consensus forecast yet? I have. Uh, I've reviewed a part of it. Um, some of it isn't uh, uh, quite out yet, uh, and they're still working on it. So, are, 
Are you and or your team preparing for any sort of turn back in the economy over the next year? Um, at, th at this point in time, obviously we'll watch the revenues on a monthly basis uh, to be sure that we're on solid ground. Uh, it's important to me as a fiscal conservative uh, to make sure that we're not spending uh, beyond our means. And we'll continue to do so. That's why it was so important uh, to me to have a growth rate calculation where we're developing a budget that uh, didn't grow faster than the economy or our wages, uh, so we made sure that we were able to live within those means, and we did that for the last couple of years. Uh, in fact, uh, without raising any tax and fees uh, and, uh, for the general fund. So uh, I believe uh, we'll continue to do so, and uh, uh, we'll watch and to see. I mean, it's, it's certainly uh, volatile on a national level. I, I don't know what effect uh, tariffs will have. I don't know what effect uh, the lack of a lack of agreement will have, uh, and certainly uh, Canada being our largest trading partner, uh, we're paying attention. So you'll, you'll be monitoring, but have you seen anything that you think you should be planning for in terms of sliding back? Yeah, I have not, uh, but we'll wait and see what the economists have to say tomorrow. I think that will be important. Uh, a consensus forecast is, uh, is very important. Uh, what did you take from the, uh, the morning consult poll that showed that your favorability had dropped substantially uh, in the last few months and, and was more in line, more or less in line with what the PPR Vermont PBS poll showed. Yeah, I can't say that I was surprised. Um, you know, I, I feel it on a daily basis when I'm out uh, in the public. Uh, to be perfectly blunt, I was uh, more surprised when, uh, when they thought I was uh, the fourth most popular uh, governor in the nation. Uh, I didn't feel I was up to that uh, that level at that point in time, uh, but uh, but that uh, this is a correction. Uh, this is uh, again, I'm not going to to govern by polls, uh, but I but I understand. I understand the disappointment. I understand the anger that's out there, uh, but I I'm going to continue to do what I feel is right for the right reasons that will benefit Vermonters. Do you think it's basically because of the gun legislation? Or do you think there's any, any carryover from uh, the budget vetoes and the two years of, of lengthy standouts? So I could probably add a few things uh, to that <laughs> as well. Uh, I think for the most part, I believe uh, that it has to do as much with the uh, gun uh, legislation as anything else. Uh, but, uh, but certainly uh, there are plenty of other opportunities uh, where I may have uh, disappointed or angered a few other people uh, along the way, uh, but it, but I'm going to continue to do what I think is right. For the moment, at least, if, according to a morning consult, Democrats like you more than Republicans. Is that a weird position to be in? <laughs> yeah. Well, it is, except you know we're in Vermont, and there are more Democrats in Vermont than uh, than Republicans. So uh, you know, I, I I've been competing uh, in in, uh, in stock car racing for three decades almost. And uh, I've had my share of dif disappointments. I've, uh, I've been leading races where uh, where I've been, uh, uh, through some stage of the race, have been uh, involved in some sort of uh, maybe controversy and put to the rear. And uh, you're just beginning it. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna continue this this race, this competition, and we'll see what happens uh, later, so. Does it matter to you the, the party label of who supports you or just the majority matters? Well, no, I mean, you know, I'm a fiscal conservative, I, and I've said before, I'm not going to apologize for being a fiscal conservative, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm a moderate in many ways as well, and uh, for those uh, in, uh, in the Republican Party that are much more conservative than I am, and, and they, um, some, some don't appreciate uh, my moderate uh, tendencies. So, uh, again, I, I think uh, in the end uh, they will see the benefit of my fiscal stance uh, in so many, many different ways. I mean, having two years, all the things we accomplished, Social Security, removal of the Social Security tax, a big deal. Uh, lowering uh, uh, the uh, income tax rates, it's a big deal. Save $30 million. I mean, it's, it's so many things that we've done uh, that, uh, uh, that I believe will have an effect uh, on the long term on the economy and on Vermont and focusing on those issues and workforce development and the demographics is something that, that we're going to continue to struggle with. But but again, I think the, they'll appreciate, uh, the, the vast majority will appreciate uh, the efforts in that regard. 
Thank you very much for coming in. Appreciate it.